For too long, deterrence theory has been used to legitimate the U.S. and other nuclear weapons states' nuclear arsenals and war plans. The dangerous doctrine is rarely critically examined or questioned, even it is widely recognized that the launch of a single tactical nuclear weapon, say midst the war in Ukraine or in confrontation over Taiwan, could escalate into an omnicidal civilization-ending nuclear exchange. Annie Jacobson's new book, Nuclear War Scenario, provides a chilling description of what could happen uh, should deterrence fail, the end of all life as we know it in 72 minutes. UN General Secretary Antonio Gutierrez warns that we are at, uh, at the knife's edge, uh, the knife's edge uh, with the risk of nuclear conflict, as he said, at the heights not seen since the Cold War. Think about that, the knife's edge. And the bulletin of the atomic scientists has repeated that humanity is 90 seconds from apocalypse. We need to take the absence of no first strike doctrines very seriously. Recent Russian nuclear threats remind us that nuclear deterrence theory doesn't guarantee that nuclear weapons cannot be used in war, launched preemptively, or sent off as a result of miscalculations or an accident. In the US, we have the tradition of threatening and preparing to initiate nuclear war to gain battlefield ad advantage or to ensure that no nation will intervene uh, to protect a nation that we are determined to attack. Think Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, even Guatemala. President Putin used the same approach when he warned that he could resort to nuclear weapons were French or other NATO uh, uh, forces deployed to Ukraine. I'll add that I, in, in recent conversations with some fairly senior Russians, uh, they've been clear uh, that were Crimea to be threatened in terms of, of, of Russian control, all bets are off in terms of the possible Russian use of nuclear weapons. The popular understanding of nuclear deterrence is that no power will attack another nuclear weapon state with its nuclear arsenal, unless it is attacked first. But who remembers that the initial draft of the Bush-Cheney doctrine for joint nuclear operations was clear, and I quote, the focus of US deterrence efforts is to influence potential adversaries to withhold actions intended to harm US national interests. Our oil, for example, under their sand. In the past, the US has prepared and threatened to initiate nuclear war to ensure that Saddam Hussein didn't use chemical weapons on US troops as they gathered to decimate his forces. The threat was made in response to Chinese shelling of, tiny, of uh, offshore Taiwanese islands and numerous times during wars and tensions with North Korea. There are numerous ways that deterrence can fail, among them systems failure, as when an early warning system misreads a flight of geese, uh, when the wrong cassette is placed in a computer, when a nuclear power's bluff is called, or when a launch signal is mistakenly sent, as happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The truth is that if the human species, our friends, our children, our grandchildren, are to survive, we must debunk and overcome deterrence theory and practice, which serves as the foundation of the existential nuclear threat. Tonight, we are privileged to have four excellent and renowned authorities to do just that. They will each speak for up to 10 minutes, and then Kevin uh, will host our Q&A session. Uh, we'll begin with former Hiroshima mayor, uh, Tadatoshi Akiba. Not content with his degrees in mathematics from Tokyo's uh, elite Tokyo University and from MIT, and after teaching four years at Tufts University, Professor Akiba returned to Japan, where he served for a decade in Japan's parliament, and then went on to become Hiroshima's mayor, from 1999 to 2011. As mayor, he became one of the world's leading advocates of nuclear weapons abolition, including launching the Hiroshima and Nagasaki-led Mayors for Peace. And he traveled the length and breadth of Japan and the world, warning of the nuclear dangers and pressing for meaningful disarmament diplomacy. One of my favorite memories is marching with him and 25,000 others in New York on the eve of the 2010 MPT Review Conference demanding the full implementation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Tad, the, uh, the forum, the page, uh, the, the webinar here is yours. Take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Joseph, and moderator Kevin, fellow panelists and fellow peace workers. Good morning from Japan. 
First, I'd like to remind ourselves that there is a hidden assumption we accept when we discuss world issues. And it is that leaders of the world, including those from nuclear weapon states, NWS for short, have minimal common sense. If this assumption loses its reality, we must choose a different approach altogether. Today, my original thought was to outline the 2040 vision, a revised version of Mayors for Peace's 2020 vision. However, I would focus on some of its components from the point of view of debunking deterrence theory. Another emphasis will be on Japan and Hiroshima. The deterrence theory is illogical, irrational, immoral, inhumane, and everything else. And as a witness, I offer Jack Chirac, whom I met in the 1990s with Madame Doi. He told us that nuclear deterrence is logically false because no one can refute the following argument. If possessing nuclear weapons guarantees national security, all countries should have should acquire nuclear weapons. Witness number two is Prime Minister Theresa May. During the July 2016 parliamentary debate, the SNP's George uh, Caravan asked her, are you prepared to authorize a nuclear strike that could kill hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children? Prime Minister May replied with one word, yes. Then continued, the whole point of deterrence is to let our enemies know that we would be prepared to use it. Prime Minister's firm resolve to use nuclear weapons must stem from her belief that the murder of 100,000 innocent enemy citizens would have an infinite weight in the minds of the enemies. At the same time, the same atrocity would be acceptable to her and her countrymen and women simply as an infinitesimal episode. Short of magic, one action causing two such contradictory reactions in people's minds is hard to swallow. Such a contradiction characterizes the deterrence theory. Going back in time to the 1980s, rationally minded people tried to show the world and its leaders what launching a nuclear war would entail by offering convincing predictions and the grave consequences of any use of nuclear weapons. A simplified list goes something like this. A, physicians would not be able to provide even minimal medicine for the victims after a nuclear strike. B, a massive exchange of megaton nuclear weapons between the United States and the Soviet Union would wipe out humanity. At, at the least, it would cause a nuclear winter and humanity would face imminent extinction. C, even the use of 100 or so Hiroshima-sized nuclear devices between India and Pakistan would create a nuclear famine that would starve two billion people to death in areas surrounding both countries and possibly in more expensive areas. I believe that the world's public and leaders understand these science-based effects on a global scale. As a result, deterrence theory now limits its scope to using only Hiroshima-sized or smaller nuclear weapons. That is why the 2016 British parliamentary discussion and President Putin's threat fall within this scope. Prime Minister May and President Putin also raised another critical point, the personal responsibility of the person pressing the button. President Putin's threat to use nuclear weapons, though most likely it was not his intention, made viewers of the evening news realize that there is a culprit to the atrocities they watch. Adding the angle of accountability makes our job of convincing nuclear weapon states and their leaders not to use even smaller sized nuclear devices more effective. To show them what they would be held accountable for, we need to remind them of the sufferings and inhumanities that the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings have caused. The moral dimension and accountability question also strengthen the TPNW's legal power. The heaviest burden is on the United States, the only country that had used nuclear weapons in war, as President Obama reminded the world, and Japan, the only country that knows the reality of nuclear war. However, they have been complicit in avoiding the issue of morality. In a simplified scenario, they both adhere to the myth that the sneaky attack on Pearl Harbor started the war and the righteous A-bombs ended it. This myth has successfully hidden the moral dimension of history from the public's eyes. 
hidden are the war responsibility of Emperor Hirohito and the morality of ultimate violence. A recent sister park agreement between the Pearl Harbor National Memorial Park and Hiroshima Peace Park, which was forced on the citizens of Hiroshima suddenly, is an example of the two governments, not forgetting the hidden agenda. Now, let me concentrate on Japan. Japan has been a docile servant to the US nuclear policy and an active blocker of the US policy change. Here are a few examples. A, in July uh, 2017, the Japanese ambassador to the United Nations declared before anyone else that it would neither sign nor ratify TPNW. The Japanese government thus sent a clear signal to all nuclear weapon states and dependent states that it was okay to oppose the abolition of nuclear weapons. It is the moral stamp of approval from the only able country in history. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe bluntly told the Obama administration that he opposed the idea of no first use being considered by Obama in 2016. The G7 summit in Hiroshima adopted the final document, the Hiroshima vision. It endorsed deterrence theory. For many innocent people, the name Hiroshima is now an official endorser of deterrence theory. Instead, what if Prime Minister Kishida, who calls himself the Prime Minister from Hiroshima, flew to Moscow to persuade President Putin to declare he will not use nuclear weapons or invited him as a special guest to Hiroshima to show him the Avon Museum. Ditto to Prime Minister Netanyev. The spirit of Hiroshima together with the city's solid and stable stance long influenced the government's persistent pro-nuclear weapons attitude. Unfortunately, in recent years, this role Hiroshima has played so effectively has eroded considerably. Here are a few examples. A, from 2011 to the present, Mayor Matsui of Hiroshima appointed ex-foreign ministry officials as the head of the Peace Culture Foundation. The foundation is responsible for formulating and executing Hiroshima City's peace policy, including drafting the peace declaration. Historically, retired anti-nuclear journalists or active peace workers held the position. In 2023, the city's Board of Education deleted Barefoot Gen, a famous cartoon by Hibakusha cartoonist from its peace reader. The Peace Declaration of 2023 last year embraced the Hiroshima Vision's central concept, the deterrence theory. Still, it also announced that the deterrence theory is bankrupt because some world leaders threatened to use these weapons. Again, what if the city of Hiroshima invited President Putin to Hiroshima or went to Moscow to persuade him, even if the Prime Minister is unwilling to do so. Finally, there are some optimistic signs. With the Labour Party in control, Scotland will likely propose gaining independence from Great Britain to become a non-nuclear weapons country. Also in Japan, since the Kishida administration seems desperate enough to try anything to raise its popularity, Given enough pressure, he may request his cabinet members to visit Hiroshima and or Nagasaki for the first time to learn about the Hibakusha's experiences and messages. As you saw, there is a vast gap between what Japan and Hiroshima could and should do and the harsh reality I just reported. We are working toward launching a new and realistic plan to fill that gap on August 6 next year, the 80th anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Please help us accomplish this goal. Oh, thank you very much.